नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी घोरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवाणी पश्चाचारिणे वंचकौपातरुभ्य कृपा सिंधु पाए पथित नम पवानेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासरी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो वेलकम एवरी वन टू आर भक्ति बाय बाव स्टडी ऑफ द श्रीमद भागवतम एंड वी आर ऑन कैंटो थ्री द टीचिंग्स ऑफ लॉर्ड कपिला एंड टुडे वी आर लुकिंग एट चैप्टर नंबर ट्वेंटी एट All right, I'm going to put the PowerPoint projection on. Everyone can see? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, visible. So chapter 28 is entitled Understanding. Understanding material nature. No, that's twenty-seven. Twenty-seven was understanding material nature. Right? We're on chapter twenty-eight. Oh, Krishna! What happened? This is what we covered yesterday, right? Oh, okay. Chapter twenty-seven overview. Ah, at last, chapter 28, Kapila's instructions on the execution of devotional service in relation to the connection with the previous chapter. Previous chapter we were talking about Gyan and applying the Gyan. Now we're talking about Astanga Yoga and meditation on the Super Soul. So how do they connect? Having recommended in the previous chapter that a devotee must bring the mind under full control, now Lord Kapila will elaborate on the yoga system known as Astanga Yoga, which is part of Vaishnava practice, because its ultimate goal is to concentrate the mind on the Lord. Right? We've got to control the mind. Very important. The mind is the, sen the, key, the king of the senses. Right? The, the senses are like the demigods and the mind is like the Supreme Lord. So we have to have the mind under full control to be able to think of the Lord. And to help us to concentrate the mind, the process is, is Astanga Yoga. 
and we're going to hear how to do Ashtanga Yoga. So the chapter, well, the first 12 verses will describe the limbs of Ashtanga Yoga. There are eight limbs in Ashtanga Yoga, of course. Preliminary Yoga Practices for Attaining Devotional Service. The Yoga Ladder included this Ashtanga Yoga, this Dhyana Yoga, right? After Karma Yoga comes Jnana Yoga. And after Jnana Yoga comes Dhyana Yoga or meditation which is practiced through the Ashtanga Yoga process. So Lord Krishna described this in chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Kapila also talking about it here. And the goal is to meditate, of, well the, pr the process is to meditation on the form of the Lord. So verses 13 to 18, we'll have a description of the Lord's form, the overall form. And then it goes on to describe about meditation on the individual limbs of the Lord. So in the beginning, just the overall form, contemplating the, the Lord's overall form, and then going into meditation on the, in, the different parts of the Lord's body, beginning, of course, from his lotus feet. And then the results of that meditation will be described. Okay, so the first section on the Astanga Yoga. Lord Kapila, the Personality of Godhead, who is the highest authority on yoga, here explains the yoga system known as Astanga Yoga. Even Patanjali explains that the target of all yoga is Vishnu. Astanga Yoga is therefore part of Vaishnava practice because its ultimate goal is realization of Vishnu. So Prabhupada has written like that, that Astanga Yoga is a part of Vaishnava practice because it helps us to meditate, to realize Lord Vishnu. The Yoga Sutras were written by Patanjali. It's one of the six darshans, one of the six methods of contemplating the, the Absolute Truth. So Patanjali is described also that the target of yoga is Vishnu, Prabhupada says. His Holiness Sri Dayananda Maharaj began writing a commentary at one point on Yoga Sutras, Patanjali Yoga Sutras. It was never published, although actually it was published in Chinese. He, he did give it to the, the Chinese BBT and, and they translated it to Chinese and published it because there's so much interest in yoga there. People wanted that. Generally, when people talk about yoga, they think of Patanjali Yoga Sutras. So the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is one approach, but he, he didn't, it's a lot of impersonalism. It doesn't give a lot of emphasis on the personal form of the Lord. So it's dangerous for people to read. So from the purport of the first verse, the achievement of success in yoga is not acquisition of mystic power, which is condemned in the previous chapter, but rather freedom from all material designations and situation in one's constitutional position. That is the ultimate achievement in yoga practice. We often find people think the goal of yoga is to get some mystic power, to be able to walk over water, to do things, to produce, to have the yoga siddhis, the prapti siddhis, asta siddhis, asta prapta siddhis. There's different cities that you can do, use 
make yourself very small, make yourself very light, or make yourself very heavy, or bring things from far away place, go against the laws of nature. I think uh, they say Houdini, there was a person called Houdini, he had these kind of yoga powers. He could be locked in a box and he could come out, somehow he could get out. Okay, but that's not the goal of yoga. Just like it, Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Devotion, people have yoga powers, but these yoga powers have been acquired also by technology now. Things like flying, you, know, you can become very light, you can fly, you can go in the airplane, walk on water, you can take a boat. You don't need to walk and spend so many lifetimes to become a great yogi, to walk over water. Just take the boat. What is the value of that yoga? And the value is the boat fare. Not very much value. So, the real goal of the yoga is not these mystic powers, but it's to get free from material designations that we identify with the material body and we are thinking ourselves in a material manner. We have to become situated in our actual constitutional position, right? That's it, on the transcendental platform, understanding our actual position. That is the real goal of yoga. So we have a little exercise here. Uh, Discuss in pairs will be a bit difficult. We'll just do it all as a class. As a class, you can. We want you all to uh, look through the first few verses there in the section one to twelve. So identify the yoga practices being prescribed in this section. All right. So look through text 1 to 12 and let's hear what are the different yoga practices which are prescribed here. First of all, say, for every item in the yoga system there is a parallel activity in bhakti yoga. But the practice of bhakti yoga is easier for this age. It's a quote from text 11. So, look through the first 12 verses, read through the verses and tell me what are the yoga practices prescribed there.
All right. Have you got some things? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, let's see. Have we got somebody who can type good? Have we got a good typist? We want to... So, what have you got? What's the first thing we should do? What's mentioned here? Huh? No! What is that? That's not... Come on! I execute prescribed duties uh, to our ability. I mean, Swadharma, Acharan. Can you just speak English, please? Yeah. Execute prescribed duties according to our uh, ability. That's very vague. I don't know what you're talking about. The process of yoga, how is it described there? What are we supposed to do? One should worship lotus feet of spiritual master? Yes, that's one thing. One should worship the spiritual master. So? One should keep performing conventional religious practices. Wait, wait. One should worship Guru, right? Second one. Yes? One should cease performing conventional... Do, do one's duty properly. No, no, don't you talk. Somebody are already talking. Oh. One should cease performing conventional religious practice and uh, should eat very frugally and always remain secluded. Or, or, come on. Can you just give me one point? should cease performing conventional religious practice practices very vague i wouldn't know what you meant so next point uh, eat very frugally and oh. remain secluded control the eating control eating process Maharaj, observe silence number 3 silence Number four. Ahimsa. Can you speak English, Prabhu? Yeah. Uh, Non-violence, practicing non-violence. How do we practice that? Uh, it's not very clear. There are many ways to interpret Ahimsa. Truthfulness. I wouldn't know how to do that. Perform austerity. Austerity. Again, it's very vague. How to do it? There will be different degrees of austerity for different people. Celibacy. It should be clean. Cleanliness. Okay, cleanliness. Control breathing. Control what? Breathing. Can you speak English, Prabhu? Control breathing, Maharaj. Breath control. What do you talk? Pranayama? What do you mean breath control? Pranayama. That is, a, that is a stage of, that is one of the limbs of the Astanga. Yes, Maharaji? Uh, practice non-violence and truthfulness. Truthfulness. Be truthful. 
Okay. And not accumulate more than uh, required. Minimize the minimize bodily demands. Appa and Saucham. You got any English, Prabhu? Do you speak English? Yes, yes. Uh, austerity and cleanliness, Maharaj. Well, we got cleanliness and we heard austerity. I said, you know, it's, it's not clear what you mean by austerity. I wouldn't know how, you know, the different austerity for one person is different for another. Celibacy. Celibacy. Okay. One person, one person speak. Hare Krishna Maharaj, control the senses. Sense control. Yeah, but that's, that's not very clear again, you know, what is sense control? Mm. Study yeah. the Vedas or scriptures? Study scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, avoid sinful activities like stealing. Okay. No stealing. Worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Worship the Lord. Yeah. To, re to refrain from theft. We had that, yeah. Practicing sitting postures and controlling the mind. Sitting postures, okay. Reading uh, authorized Vedic scripture. No, we got that. Okay, so let's look at these and see what are the parallel activities in Bhakti Yoga. One should worship the spiritual master. Yeah. So in Bhakti Yoga, we also have that, right? It's the same. Yes. So no difference. Number two, control eating process. Eat only prasadam. Yeah. Okay, for devotees, eat only prasadam. Number three, silence. We can preach Prajalpa. Huh? We can preach the glories of the Lord. Is that silence? No Prajalpa, Maharaj. No Prajalpa. Talking only about Krishna. Chanting Hare Krishna is the sound of silence. Right? So, Chanting Hare Krishna, that is silence. Cleanliness. Huh? No illicit sex. Cleanliness is not an actual principle of bhakti yoga, but it's important. It's a, it's, it has to be there in order to practice bhakti yoga. But cleanliness itself is not part of bhakti yoga but we, certainly devotees we have to give attention to cleanliness Prabhupada would say cleanliness is next to godliness yes so bathing every day and uh, bath, washing one's cloth every day and you know, these kind of things very important for devotees and after take before taking after taking prasadam wash your hands and feet and mouth these kind of things and to clean shaven also Prabhupada didn't like long hair didn't he liked devotees he said every month you must shave your head And didn't didn't want to see beards also. So it's all cleanliness. 
than truthfulness. Is it no gambling? Huh? No gambling? <laughs> yeah, the parallel principle in bhakti. How do we observe truthfulness? What well, we speak according to Shastra. If we are speaking according to Shastra, that is truth. That is real truth. Truthfulness is one, the only principle which is left in the Kali Yuga. The other legs of Dharma are gone. Satyam Sut, the, the, the cleanliness, the mercy, the austerity are all gone. But truthfulness is remaining a little bit because Shastra is still present. So when we speak according to Shastra, that is truth. Minimizing the bodily demands. How, how does this apply to devotees? We can practice simple living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using our senses in the service of Krishna, minimizing bodily demands. Bodily demands are eating, sleeping, mating, defending. So, eating, sleeping, they're all done in the service of Krishna. Mating, defending, it's all for Krishna's service. We, but we want to be very careful not to become the servant of the senses, to minimize these demands. Don't eat too much, and don't sleep too much. Don't eat too little, and don't sleep too little. There has to be some regulation, some moderation. So we shouldn't be controlled by the bodily demands. We should, con we should control them. And then celibacy. What do we, what's our view on celibacy? A Krishna conscious devotee? How do we regard the principle of celibacy? Only begetting Krishna conscious children. Yes, celibacy is observed by three ashrams. Only the grihastas are allowed to have connection with the, op with, the, with the opposite sex. And in marriage, and that should be for the purpose of conceiving Krishna conscious children. That is celibacy. Therefore, we have grihasta brahmacharis or brahmachari grihastas. I can't remember what it is. They're grihastas, but they practice celibacy. In other words, they, they only have a relationship, they only engage in sexual activities when they want to have children, they want to conceive a child. Otherwise, they're sent celibacy, strict celibacy. So that is celibacy. So we don't see any difference between the grihastas and the brahmacharis and the sannyasis, vanapras. They're, if they're properly following the rules and regulations. Then number eight, study scriptures. We study Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita, these are our scriptures. The yogis, they have their books, they have things like this, yoga, uh, yoga sutras, Patanjali yoga sutras. We know Advaita Acharya, he made Lord Chaitanya very angry because he was reading the Yoga Vashishta, which glorifies impersonal liberation. And Lord Chaitanya was very upset. So we don't read these kind of scriptures, but we do read scripture related. No stealing, recognizing 
what belongs to another person. Chanakya Pandit says, what does Chanakya Pandit say? How a person should see other person's property? Lost to a para So others' uh, property is just a waste for me. What? Lost to a para What so is it? Others', um, others property is like uh, useless for me. Yes, another another's property is just like some garbage in the street. We don't take it, we don't touch it. It's no meaning for us. Then worshipping the Lord, of course we do that. The yogis also have to worship. They have to offer respects to the Lord, whoever they are worshipping. What about practicing asanas, do we have that in bhakti yoga? Yeah, Srila Prabhupada used to say that while chanting sit straight, so we also asana sitting straight. Well, that's sitting. But the, what about asanas? Do we do asanas in our bhakti yoga? What do we do? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. While chanting, we, we sit erect. We straight, erect, erect and chant. That is one of the asanas. But there's other things we do besides just sitting. Yeah, Maharaj, when we do obeisances to the Lord Shiv and when we do Vaishnavas, we offer obeisances. So that's. Uh, Yes, yeah, offering obeisances and dancing in kirtan. okay. So offering obeisances and dancing in kirtan, that's our, we get a lot of bending practice, we get a lot of asana, doing our dandabats, doing obeisances. You go and see all the deities. If you go on Parikrama, all the time you're offering obeisances to this place and that place. And then dancing in the kirtan also. Very good. You keep very healthy. Get a lot of exercise. And controlling the mind by. How do we control our mind? By chanting, Maharaj, attentive chanting. By attentive chanting, right. Only chanting? Any other thing we can do to control the mind? We can meditate on the deities of the Lord. Really? What's By that? Hearing uh, Bhagavatam Guru. Hearing yes. Bhagavatam, right. Yes. Chanting and hearing are recommended in Bhakti Yoga. Hear the Bhagavatam and hear the Holy Name and chant the Holy Name, okay? All of these different activities are very helpful for us. So you can see the parallel between the Astanga Yoga and the Bhakti Yoga, right? Okay, Prabhu, you can close this, we'll go back to our PowerPoint presentation. Hmm. Okay, yoga practice. So here you can see the different stages of the Astanga Yoga. The Yam and the Niyam. So this is all described, detail. What is Yama? What are the things we're supposed to do or we're not supposed to do? We're not supposed to be violent, as you said, Ahimsa. And we, we're not supposed to tell lies, we should not steal, 
We should not accept more than necessary. We should not have illicit sex. And we should not make a lot of noise. We should observe silence. And what are we supposed to do? The niyam. We're supposed to follow one's duty in varna and ashram. Avoid forbidden duties. We're not supposed... We're, we should do what is our actual duty. We shouldn't do things which we're not supposed to do, like forbidden duties, things like have you, working with animals, and people sell meat, cook meat, serving meat or alcohol or these kind of things, contaminated foodstuffs. So forbidden duties, what's, what, things which a devotee is not supposed to do. Like one time Prabhupada told all the devotees they had to get jobs. So it turned out they, the only job they could get was in the cigarette factory. When Prabhupada heard devotees were all working in a cigarette factory, he said, no, no, no. He said, you cannot do that. Stop that. Give up that job. It's all like that, forbidden duties. All right, what are we supposed to do? Constant thought of liberation. Yeah, we should think about liberation. Eat pure, fu pure food in moderated quantities. Live in a secluded, peaceful place. Very nice. Austerity, cleanliness, study Vedas and worship of the Supreme Lord. Okay. We're supposed to be clean, we're supposed to be austere a little bit. What is austerity will be different for different people. We observe us. What is our austerity as devotees? How do we observe austerity? Depending on the Okay. Waking up early in the morning to go to the morning program. Yeah, good. Like fasting on Ekadasi days. Fasting on Ekadasi, no grains. And observing like yesterday, Lord Nityananda's appearance, half day fasting. Not much fasting, just a half a day. Right? This kind of austerity also. No. What, de what destroys austerity? Do you remember? What is it that destroys austerity? Intoxication. Yes, intoxication. Things like what? Sorry. What are the things which are intoxicating? Liquor. Yes. Tea and, Tea and coffee. Coca Cola. Onion garlic. Onion and garlic. <laughs> well, yeah, they are aphrodisiacs. They're they're not very good, you're right. And also pride. Remember, pride destroys austerity. If we're not humble, then we won't be inclined to be austere. Because people have no humility, they're not able to be austere. They cannot take any austerity. Yes, people come to the temple and, oh, sit on the floor, you know, oh, sit and listen to lectures. They can't do it. Or ask them to chant Hare Krishna, ask them to go for Sankirtan. No, they don't want to do it. They can't do austerity. People, Kali Yuga, not, they're not very austere. They're not, it's not easy for people. Lord Chaitanya makes it so easy, but still people are so in the bodily concept, they cannot do it. Okay, so yam and niyam, and then asana is not mentioned, but we have pranayama. Pranayama, the asanas, the purpose of the asanas is to make the body flexible so that you can sit. Because when you're going to meditate, you have to sit for a long time. If your body's too stiff, you won't be able to sit. You won't be able to meditate. 
And so, you, and like to do pranayama, you have to sit. So the asana comes first, you do the asanas, get the body flexible, they can sit down and then do pranayama. Prabhupada calls pranayama the nose pressing yoga. The nose pressing yoga, right? Kumbhaka, Purnaka and Kechaka, they're different, they're different processes, pressing the nose different times and diff breathe in one nostril and hold the breath and then breathe out the other nostril and hold the breath and inhale the other nostril, hold the breath like this. This is the pranayama, control the breath, purify the passage for prana by practice of kumbhaka, puraka and rechaka so that the mind becomes steady and pure. This is a mechanical process of controlling the mind. How much purification you get, we don't know. You have to really, to do this kind of thing, you really have to spend a long time because it's not so quick. It takes a long time. So pranayama is after asana, pranayama and then pratyahara, pratyahara, withdraw the senses from material objects and turn them towards the, the heart using the mind. So this pratyahara is described in Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna talks about the, the turtle. You know the turtle, that he's swimming in the sea, but at a certain point he can withdraw his legs under the shell and he will just be under the shell. Everything will just be withdrawn under the shell and he'll just be inside the shell. So this is pratyahara, withdrawing the senses from the material objects, turn them towards the heart using the mind, right? You can try it mentally. Withdraw your senses and bring them in towards the heart, using the mind. It's a mental process. The benefit is association with the sense objects is destroyed. That's what you want, right? We want to give up the association with the sense objects. So, we have to turn the senses within. So this is pratyahara, then the next stage is called dharana. Dharana. Fix the prana at one spot among the various chakras by the mind. Meditate on the Supreme Lord by looking at the tip of the nose. You want to try it? Look at the tip of the nose. How long can you do it? Fix a, pra fix a prana at one spot among the chakras. Right, we know we've got chakras or energy levels within the, within the body. They go right up to the, the top of the head. The, we have our uh, spot in the skull there where the chakra can, where the, the prana can go out at the time of death. So there are just, there are seven chakras in the body and you can elevate the prana by mental concentration. And the benefit is, sins are destroyed, so pratyahara dharna dhyana, the meditation begins. Meditation on the individual limbs of the Lord and on the pastimes of the in the pastimes of the Supreme Lord, uncontrollable qualities are destroyed. Of course, if we meditate on the Supreme Lord, we'll destroy all the bad qualities. So this is dhyana and dhyana leads to samadhi, the ultimate goal. 
So you can see the different stages of meditation. Not so easy process, not for ordinary people in this age. So we have described samadhi, then he attains samadhi of the mind. When the mind becomes detached from all material objects, the mind suddenly gets destroyed. Having destroyed the misconceptions of his body, he sees the atma without covering. Thus he is situated in his own position beyond happiness and distress. So this is the Astanga Yoga described. Are you all able to see this, by the way? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh huh. Okay. So you can see it's a lot, a long process. People practice the asanas hardly; they ever get past the asanas. And then pranayama, you have to really be able to sit a long time. We had one devotee join our movement. He, he was from USA, he joined in USA and later on Tamal Krishna Maharaj brought him over to Hong Kong and he was trained in Astanga Yoga. He was very expert. He's one of the most famous Astanga Yoga teachers today. He travels around the world demonstrating asanas. And he told me he did pranayama and said that his teacher was a very famous teacher. He's left the world now. His name was somebody called Pratapi Joyce. And uh, there was an, uh, his, his teacher was Krishna Namacharya. No, Krishna Namacharya. They were Sri Vaishnava. And uh, they taught this pranayama. And the pranayama, he said, just sit for hours and press the nose and concentrate on breathing. He said, the legs would ache, so difficult. Very, very long time sitting, waiting, just pressing the nose, concentrating the breathing. And then gradually, eventually, you come, you, to the, you have to do these other stages of concentration. So, for ordinary people, they could never practice this Astanga Yoga. People talk about Astanga Yoga, but actually they're, they're just joking. They're not really, they don't get into the higher levels of Astanga Yoga. So, here you can see the nice di diagrammatic presentation of the different levels. The yama, don't, the things you don't do. And then the niyam, the things you do, right? Chanting, <laughs> the don't, you don't do, you don't do meat, fish and egg, intoxication, gambling like that. No nonsense, Prabhupada says. And then the things you do, and then the sitting postures and the Ex different exercise, controlling the body, then the nose pressing yoga, then pratyahara, withdraw the senses, control the mind, absorb the mind, and then meditate on the Supreme Lord and come to trance. So this is the stage, this is the yoga ruddha, the cessation of work. At the bottom you have yoga rurukshu, cultivating detachment. This is described in Bhagavad Gita like this. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next section. Description of the Lord's form, verses 13 to 18. We invite you, identify different aspects of the Lord's form. Have a look through these verses, 13 to 18. Let me hear some aspects of the Lord's form and include in your description the metaphors being used. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question with respect to the previous section. Can I ask? All right. Yeah, so it is said in pranayama, if one controls his breathing, all the chakras in the body, they get balanced and the doshas are destroyed. Am I right, Maharaj? That's what it was saying there, anyway, yes. Yeah. So how does Hare, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra do this? I mean, we don't really control the chakras and all that, but yet the doshas are destroyed. How does the chakras get balanced out? Well, we don't worry about the chakras. We simply concentrate on the soul, right? But not the body. We don't have to worry about chakras. You don't have to worry about these things. What we're practicing is chanting Hare Krishna. By chanting Hare Krishna, then everything will be taken care of. Body is material. So if we chant Hare Krishna properly, the body will be purified, body will be spiritualized. How does it work? By spiritual sound vibration. Everything is under Krishna's control. So these chakras are also under Krishna's control. And if Krishna wants them to be balanced, he will balance them. If Krishna wants them not to be balanced, it won't happen. We don't worry about the chakras. We, our concentration is on Krishna and the holy name of Krishna. And then everything else will take place naturally. Now, the yogis, they're spending a lot of time meditating on the chakras. They also have to die. They also have to suffer old age and disease. We have seen the great yogis who did all this Astanga Yoga, they also had these prob they had problems with their material body. Just because you concentrate on chakras doesn't mean you don't get any problems. And there'll be no faults in the body. Body's material, there's going to be problems. But we just have to concentrate on Krishna. The devotees were on a, were on a morning walk one time and they were walking in the park and they saw this one man doing yoga, standing on his head. And uh, so Prabhupada said, oh, oh, so very good, very good for health. So the devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, should we also do it? And Prabhupada looked at them and said, not required. Not required. You don't have to worry. You just chant Hare Krishna. So, you don't have to worry. If we chant Hare Krishna, everything will be taken care of. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, that was wonderful. But is there any um, particular section in the Shastras which really gives like a breakdown, like how we see um, uh, breakdowns being given in the Shastras? Um, so where it shows that how the Hare Krishna Mahamantra really works in a, from a scientific perspective. I'm just thinking from that. I know it works. Well, yes. but one devotee, one of our own devotees, has done a, a, a PhD thesis on the effects of chanting Hare Krishna and how it brings one to the mode of goodness. That's how it works. That you get free of passion and ignorance by chanting Hare Krishna. You come to the mode of goodness. And by coming to the mode of goodness, then a lot of these, all these problems will be removed. Maharaj, do you have that article by any chance or the name of the article I can research? Well, one devotee, the devotee, uh, it's a, a devotee called, his name was uh, Dira Govinda. He's in America. He's in USA. Dira Govinda. And he, he teaches, he teaches the chanting of Hare Krishna and he teaches the whole aspect, the whole science of chanting Hare Krishna. Uh, and he's not so much active in ISKCON, he has some leaning towards uh, uh, Ritvikism or something, I'm not sure. But uh, 
is not so much active in ISKCON, but at the same time some ISKCON people do go to him and they do take his course because he has a very good presentation on the effects of chanting Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Martin. That was really helpful. Thank you so much. All right. So please look through these verses, 13 to 18. Can you, would someone like to give us a, a particular aspect of the Lord's form? Your favorite aspect of the Lord's form with the metaphors which are used to describe it? <laughs> Krishna um, Maharaj, so it says the um, Supreme Personality of Godhead has a cheerful lotus-like countenance with ruddy eyes like the interior of a lotus. Eyes like the interior of a lotus. Yes? Yeah, and a swarthy body um, like the petals of a blue lotus. And what? The swarthy. His, his body? Swathi, so it's S um, W A R T H Y. Swarti. Yeah. What does it mean? Um, it's the first time I've come across that. Swarti. Um, Not a common word. Yeah. Um, like that of a lotus uh, so okay so uh, meaning that it's like that of a lotus flower with petals tinted blue and white so we're talking about his eyes yeah there's two in there sorry yes his eyes so his eyes white. are like the petals of a lotus blue and white was it yeah, no, and then his body, so there's two in that, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, so his eyes are ruddy, like the interior of the lotus. His and eyes his... are ruddy. Yes, ruddy. Mm -hmm. Like the interior of a lotus, and? And then um, a swathi body, like the petals of a blue lotus. The swarthy body. Swarthy means the, the basically being tinted um, blue and white. I'm not too sure. Like a bluish color. Okay. Okay, somebody else? Thank you, Shabbat. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the Lord's garment is compared to the uh, is yellowish, like the filaments of. A lotus. Uh, all right. The body, the garment, the large cloth covering the lower part of his body, is it? Or just his garments? Just his garments. The, the lower, uh, the dhoti. Okay. So it's, it's like the color of a lotus. The filament of a uh, lotus. Oh, the fil oh, filament of a lotus. Yes. Uh -huh. Lord on their hair has uh, Gata, Chakra, Sankha and Padma. All right. Is there any metaphor? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Lord's uh, ruby nails resemble the orbit of the moon. His ruby nails resemble the orbit of the moon. The orbit of the moon. His ruby nails resemble the orbit of the moon. Okay, that's an interesting one. <laughs> okay, yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Lord, um, wear garlands of forest flowers. A garland of forest flowers. Forest flowers, is it? Yeah. Humming with bees also. Uh -huh. All right. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Lord has a Srivatsa mark on his chest. Srivatsa mark on his chest. Yes. Lord has a Kostuba gem. Should be Kostuba gem round his neck. Yes. Around his neck. 
God has black curly hair. Yeah, should be. Yeah. <laughs> Lord stands on the lotus of his devotee's heart. Oh, when he stands on the lotus of the devotee's heart. Hmm. It says, uh, the color of Krishna's body is compared to that of a bluish cloud. Okay, the color of Krishna's body is like the bluish cloud. No metaphors? Yeah, it also says uh, that it is like that of a lotus flower with petals tinted blue and white. Uh -huh. So everything seems to be like lotus flowers, huh? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, the Lord is ever youthful and always eager to bestow his blessings upon his devotees. Yes. The Lord is ever youthful and always eager to bestow his blessings on his devotees. Okay, the Lord so is adorned with a pearl necklace, crown, armless, bracelet. Is this all in verses 13 to 18? Yeah, this is, this is in verse 15. What I, I just said. Okay, so we're going to, we're hearing about the Lord's form. Now we're going to go. Srila uh, Prabhupada's purport accomplished three purposes. Reading Prabhupada's purport, they denigrate impersonalism. Right? You hear about the Lord's form, we can understand the Lord is a person, He's not just some light, some energy. But he's a person, so very important to hear this personal philosophy. And then second point, directs the devotees to the deity form. We're hearing about the form of the Lord, we can understand the Lord's form. And think of the Lord as a person, as a deity, make the Lord our deity. We want to put the deity, in, of course he's in our heart, we want to build a nice throne for him in our heart. Understand how, how our heart is the resting place of the Lord. And then of course it describes the beauty of the Lord. So this is Prabhupada's purports, important for us to hear about the form of the Lord and to meditate, be able to meditate on these different aspects of the Lord's body, His form, what does it resemble. Often people, sim oh, they will simply say, oh, He has a peacock feather, oh, He plays the flute. They don't know anything. So worshipping the Deity, the very important part of our Krishna conscious philosophy, and deities can be made from different elements. So eight kinds of forms recommended for the devotees to see from different elements. They can be made from sand, just like it's mentioned in the Krishna book, when the gopis were doing Katyayana Vrat, they would worship Goddess Katyayani and they'd make a deity of Katyayani out of sand. The deity can also be made from clay. We see many people make deities and at different festivals they use clay to make the deities. Wood, of course, we have Daru Brahma, Lord Jagannath is made from wood. We have stone, we have the, many of our deities, mostly our deities are made from stone, marble, and Radha Krishna, like that. Sometimes Gornitai also made from stone. But deity can also be within the mind. If one is very powerful, very advanced, he can put the deity within the mind and worship there. Deity can be made from jewels. People have sometimes these jewels they put into the form of the Lord. Very beautiful, very, very expensive also. Deity can be made from metal. We have the deities, 
they're made from the uh, uh, different metals combined together, the brass deities, and sometimes made from many different metals mixed together, just like Panchatattva deities made from metal, different metals mixed together. And they can be painted, painted colors, pictures, paintings, they can also be deities. All of the forms are of the same value. We shouldn't think one is less valuable than another. The Lord in, made from jewels is as valuable as the Lord made from sand because they're both the Supreme Lord. The material elements don't make the, any difference. So hearing about the Lord's form we go on to meditate on the different limbs of the Lord. And meditation on the form, on the limbs of the Lord will begin from his lotus feet. Right? The different limbs of the Lord's forms. We have, beginning from his lotus feet, you can see on the slide, you can see the, the different items which are all marked on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And each of these different items which are on Lord Krishna's feet, they have some special significance. Just like, just like there's a, an instrument for controlling elephants, right? You can see that instrument for controlling elephants. It's on the, the left foot, on the, on the left hand side. They stick it. They stick it in the elephant to control the elephant. So, the mind is like an elephant. Just like a stubborn elephant, our mind needs to have that instrument to control us. And the umbrella, we are under the shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna. And so the umbrella, Krishna is like an umbrella, it gives us shelter from the material energy. And the fish, the fish is the symbol of Cupid, the god of love in the material world. And the fish being on the lotus feet of Krishna indicates that Cupid is conquered by Krishna. And Cupid is under the control of Krishna. The flag, the flag means victory. One who takes shelter of Krishna's lotus feet, he will be victorious. So like that, there's, there's a, a booklet written by one devotee and he just, it's a translation of the book by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he's explained the meaning, the significance of each of the items which are there on the lotus feet of Krishna and Radharani and you can see in the temple in Mayapur, they have the lotus feet of the Astasakis and Radha Madhava, and they have all these different markings on their lotus feet. Different for each deity, of course. So this is how to meditate on the lotus feet of the Lord. You meditate on the different markings which are there on his lotus feet. So different limbs of the Lord's form describe it with metaphors, and their glories, the benefits they grant upon the devotees. Right? Maybe you can pick a limb. Right? How many people? Well, we've got a lot of people. Let's go through it together. Begin with the lotus feet. We'll have somebody. Who wants to take the lotus feet and analyze it? We'll come back to you. We'll give you time. We have any volunteers? I'll do it. All right, all three of you can do it. You meditate on the lotus feet and give us the information. See if you come up with the same things. And then above the lotus feet, we have the thigh. The thighs of the Lord, right? Who's going to do that? Come on, we want two people at least. I can 
Okay, thank you, Madhuji. One more person. All right, I can. Okay, on the thigh, right, and then next person on the the waist of the Lord. Who's going to do that? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. I can do that. Thank you. And then the chest, the Lord's chest. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. And then above, the, then we have the Lord's arms. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Lila right. I'll do that. Yes. And then the, we have the Lord's face. Who's going to, who's a fortunate person? Yes? Who's going to and tell us about the Lord's face? Madhav Kantapu. Thank you. And then, then, then we have also the Lord's eyes, his teeth, can all be included in the face. Okay? So, let's begin from the lotus feet. Hare Krishna. Um, so, for the lotus feet, um, it says basically that um, devotees should first concentrate their minds on the, lo on the Lord's lotus feet, which are adorned with the marks of a thunderbolt, a gourd, a banner, and a lotus. Um, and then as uh, was already mentioned, um, the splendor of their beautiful ruby nails resembles the orbit of the moon and dispels the thick gloom of one's heart. So obviously that's showing the beautiful potency of um, focusing on, uh, of focusing, some, uh, focusing one's mind on the lotus feet of the Lord. So in the purport, um, 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 basically, Shulam Prabhupada says that Mayavadis find it difficult to fix their, mind, um, their, their minds on an impersonal existence of the Absolute Truth. Um, but obviously, we're very fortunate that we are given a, dis a, given a concrete description of um, the Lord, um, Lotus Feet. And basically, it says that the Lord's soul is depicted with distinctive lines resembling a thunderbolt, a flag, a lotus flower and a gourd. Um, the luster of these toenails, which are brilliantly prominent, resemble the light of the moon. And uh, thereby he says that if the yogi looks upon the marks of the Lord's soul on the, bri on the blazing brilliance of his nails, um, he can be freed from the darkness of ignorance in material existence. So it's obviously um, it's a huge thing that we achieve by focusing on the on the um, on the lotus feet of the Lord. Um, and this is so this form of liberation it's just not by mental speculation but um, by seeing the light emanating from the lustrous pronouns of the Lord. So um, in other words that as a practicing devotee we should first focus our uh, mind on the lotus feet of the Lord. If um, we want freedom from the darkness of ignorance in the material existence. Okay, thank you, Mariji. Very in informative. We begin our meditation on the Lord by first of all focusing on his lotus feet. When we come before a superior personality, we will look down. And similarly, when we come before the Supreme Lord, before the Deity, we should begin observing the Deity from His lotus feet. So it's very nice to be familiar with the different items of the Lord's lotus feet. And uh, maybe you remember some pastimes about the Lord's lotus feet. Yeah, can you think of any pastimes about the Lord's lotus feet? Um, at the moment, I'm thinking of... Um, the Lord's lotus feet and his work. Sorry? What did you say? I'm personally, I'm thinking of the... To um, the Lord's feet, the Lord can 
Yeah, yes, it appears what is lotus feet. It pierced the covering of the universe, and the water of the Kajo ocean came in and flows through the universe in the form of the Ganges water. And the past, the, Krishna Maharaj, pastime of Akrura, when he going to Vrindavan, he saw the lotus feet of the Lord on the land of Vrindavan. Uh -huh. Okay, so the the Lord's lotus feet. The, the water which has washed his lotus feet is taken on the head of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva's hair is always wet with the water which has washed the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. So like the... Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Uh, Maharaj, also in the past time of Ramanadev, uh, Lord covered with his lotus feet the entire planetary system. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, above the feet, we have the thigh. Who's going to tell us about the Lord's thighs? Prabhu, your voice is not clear. Let Madhaji speak. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my respectful obeisances. So here, Srila Prabhupada writes that uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is a reservoir of all strength, and that strength is in the Lord's thigh. So then after the, it rests on the Lord's thigh, and the uh, thighs are like whitish blue, like the luster of the linseed flower, and it appears, it appears most graceful than the Lord is of Garuda. And uh, uh, it is covered from the thigh, uh, from the hip to the ankle, it's covered by a yellow garment. And uh, so Srila Prabhupada says that all, uh, there is no need of any imagination. So uh, it is um, it, all the transcendent, about all the, uh, the parts and how to meditate, it is already given. That is what Srila Prabhupada writes, that uh -huh. we need to know the Lord is person. So we don't need to have any imagination. Right. Thank you. So the you the Lord's thighs are covered with cloth, and his, we see his thighs as he sits over on the shoulders of Garuda. Right. Yes. Please. Yeah. All right. And above the thigh, next limb of the Lord, the waist is it? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So on the waist of uh, the Lord, we can see the navel. So the, uh, the navel of the Lord is like is moon-like, and it is the center of all the abdomen. Uh, of all, it is in the center of his abdomen. It is very beautiful. It is moon-like. So here the um, it is also the foundation of all the material creation. So Prabhupada here in the corporate is giving beautiful uh, analogy of a baby in the womb, how the baby in the womb is connected to the mother through the umbilical cord. So similarly, Brahmaji, who is the creator of this uh, uh, material world, he is connected to the Lord through the lotus stem. So, um, so this is the foundation of the entire universe from where the lotus stem is originating and it is containing the entire uh, planetary system. Oh, okay. So they relate the, the Lord's abdomen to the universal lotus flower from which Lord Brahma takes birth. Okay, thank you, Maharaji. And then the chest of the Lord. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Janat Pranam. So um, here, uh, description of the Lord's chest, uh, it is said that uh, the Lord's chest is the abode of the goddess of fortune and um, it gives uh, pleasure to the mind and full satisfaction for the eyes. Uh, the Lord's chest gives full satisfaction to the eyes and in the part part, uh, Shri Prabhupada says that um, seeing the deity form of the Lord uh, is uh, same to seeing the form of the Lord and there is no difference and uh, the process of smaranam out of the nine positions of bhakti, uh, the yogis can take advantage of that. And those who are very advanced in this process, they can uh, stay anywhere in a solitary place and meditate on the form of the Lord. But who is in less advanced position, he has to go to the temple and then he has to directly see the form of the Lord. Uh, so Prabhupada says that. And, and one more thing about the neck, um, it is said that uh, uh, the Lord's neck is 
um, uh, the Lord's neck is um, enhances the beauty of the coast of a gem and in the Prabhupada Prabhupada says that normally um, the neck uh, the gem it, it decorates the neck of any person but for the Lord the Lord's neck decorates the coast of a gem oh, the Lord's neck adds to the beauty of the Kustuba gem because the Lord's neck is so beautiful that the Kustuba gem is benefited by being around the neck of the Lord. Okay, thank you Prabhu. And then above the, above the neck we have the arms, oh we have the arms, right? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, so here uh, in uh, text number 27, it is said that the arms is the source of all the powers of the demigods and uh, also uh, we should concentrate on the polished ornaments uh, which are there on the Lord's hand. So in the um, purport, Prabhupada says the ornaments on the arms of the Lord are as brilliant and lustrous as if they've been polished very recently. And uh, it also says about the um, what he is holding, he is holding the Sudarshan Chakra which contains 1000 spokes and has a dazzling luster and he also has a conch uh, which looks like a swan on his uh, lotus like palm and uh, the lord also has the club it's just called the kaumodaki and it's very very dear to him and the lord uses that to smash the inimical demons and uh, it is therefore to smear with the blood of the demons yeah. and uh, yeah and it says how he smashes the demons and their blood gets mixed with the uh, with the uh, mud and the earth, so that's uh, Prabhupada is also talking about that in the uh, Does it, you you mentioned about the Sudarshan Chakra, and you mentioned yes. about the conch, and you mentioned about the club. We didn't hear anything about the lotus. Did he mention that? No, Maharaj. Somehow that doesn't seem to appear over here. Wow. But there is some um, little mention about the garlands of, that the Lord is wearing on his neck. Uh, which are always surrounded by bumblebees and their nice buzzing sound uh, is heard and uh, one should meditate upon the pearl necklace on the Lord's neck uh, so which is considered to represent the pure living entities who are always engaged in the service of the Lord. Are we told anything about the colors? How many colors are in the garland? Or uh, not really, Maharaj. I only find that it says it's just a nice garland which is there. Uh, and uh, yeah, Ropad also just talks about the jewels and pearls and all that on his neck. And uh, yeah, there is no colors or specific description of the garland itself okay. uh, in these two purposes. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Very interesting. Hare Krishna. And then the face of the Lord? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Lord's lotus face is uh, adorned with uh, curly hair and. Uh, also, his uh, nose is prominent, and uh, the cheeks, which is uh, crystal clear and uh, illuminated by uh, glittering shaped earrings, uh, and uh, I don't know, curly hair. And what about what about the earrings? How are they shaped? Shaped uh, is a earring shaped uh, is like a oscillations of glittering alligators. Alligators, yes, right. Yeah. yeah, should be alligators, right? They're shaped yeah, like alligators. And, uh, curly hair and dancing eyebrows, uh, decorated by lotus-like eyes. And uh, Shla Prabhupada uh, gave a very good uh, one. Uh, is Prabhupada saying that uh, the comparison is that in this verse that lo Lord's face is compared to a lotus, and his uh, black hair is compared to humming bees. So. Uh, swimming around the lotus and to eyes compared to the fish swimming above so the lotus flower on the water is very beautiful and sound of humming bees and fish uh, and then uh, next verse Prabhupada is also saying about uh, uh, Lord eyes is the soothing eyes with um, accompanied by smile so devotees made on the Lord smile also full of abundant graces and uh, the eyebrows mentioned here is a which is uh, to charm the cupid for the uh, is also uh, the smile drives away the ocean of tears of uh, uh, all the griefs so 
Oh. Is it the smile, his smile, his eyebrows conquer the God of love, right? The sex. Yeah, Cupid, yeah, charming the Cupid, God of love. That they, he actually conquers the God of love, right? Yep. And you said the, uh, the two eyes are like fish and the hair is like bees, is it? Hair is like bees. So the hair is like bees and the two eyes are like two fish? Yes. And the, and the, and what was the connection? It's a lot of face is like a compared to a lotus. The face. So on the lotus, there's uh, the black hairs of the bees. On the lotus, there are the bees. So, uh, and then the eyes are the fish. So the fishes are there in the swimming. And the, uh, there's a beauty when, when there is a lotus flower on the water, uh, sound surrounded by the bees and fish. Okay. So the bees and the fish makes a very beautiful presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Okay, so this way the, the, the yogis, they meditate on the, the different bodily parts of the Lord. Reasons why the process of hearing and chanting is superior to and fixing the mind on the pastimes of the Lord. The process of hearing and chanting is better than just simply trying to meditate on the Lord. Prabhupada explains, the only difference is that hearing and fixing the mind on the pastimes of the Lord is easier than visualizing the form of the Lord within one's heart because as soon as one begins to think of the Lord, especially in this age, the mind becomes disturbed. And due to so much agitation, the process of seeing the Lord within the mind is interrupted. You know, it's, we have to understand it's not such an easy thing to control our mind and to concentrate our mind on the form of the Lord. But if we do the hearing and chanting, then we can pretty much concentrate. But to just simply sit, just like every day we're studying the Srimad Bhagavatam a couple of hours. So we can do it. But if you have to just sit for two hours and think of the Lord in your mind, very difficult, very difficult. So many other disturbances are going to come. So, for spiritual advancement, it's better to hear and chant. Another point, for example, even a child can hear and derive the benefit of meditating on the pastimes of the Lord simply by listening to a reading from the Bhagavatam that describes the Lord as he is going to the pasturing grounds with his cows and friends. So, those of you who have a family, have children, you can tell them about Krishna's pastimes, you can tell them about Krishna going to the forest with the cows and the cowherd boys, you can tell them about Krishna's dealings with the gopis, you can tell them how the gopis are taking butter to the market, and Krishna is saying, you have to pay tax to me. There's so many things we can relate to people. We can tell them about how Krishna picked up Govardhan Hill, and the Govardhan Leela, and Krishna's, how Krishna is, uh, Mother Yashoda looks in Krishna's mouth because they, they, she heard Krishna had been eating dirt and she wants Krishna to open her mouth, his mouth and she looks in his mouth and she saw the universe. All of these things, you can tell them to children, they can be, they will become very absorbed in hearing. So this, this is proof that the process of hearing and chanting is very easy. But to try to get people to just sit and think of God, think and remember Him, meditate on Him, very difficult. But 
they hear the pastime, they hear about the past, they'll remember it. They'll remember the story you told them. It becomes a meditation simply by hearing or if they're maybe older children you can read from the book. So it's very important for us to understand the benefit of hearing and chanting. You want to remember Krishna, you want to meditate, that is the third step of bhakti yoga. First comes hearing, then chanting, then remembrance comes. When we do good hearing and then we, we've heard properly, then we can chant, then remembrance comes about. But the bhakti yoga process begins with hearing. As we heard yesterday, Lord Kapila was saying, you have to hear for a long time, hear for a long time, and then you can chant and then remembrance will come. In this age of Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya has recommended that one should always engage chanting and hearing, Bhagavad Gita. Lord Chaitanya always gave great importance to hearing when he was talking with Ramananda Rai. He asked Ramananda Rai, give some verse from the scriptures about the goal of life. And Ramananda Rai began talking, well, Varnashram, Lord Chaitanya said, that's external, go on. And then he, after Varnashram, then he said, offer the results of our work to the Lord. Lord Chaitanya was not satisfied. He said, go on. Ramananda Rai said, surrender everything to the Lord. Raman, Lord Chaitanya was still not satisfied. He said, go on. And then he said, uh, meditate on the, understand the Brahman. Come to the platform of Brahman, knowing that we're not the body. Lord Chaitanya said, keep going. And then he came up with a verse from the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam, where Lord Brahma says, just simply remain in whatever position you are in and hear about Krishna in the association of devotees. In this way, you can conquer Krishna. Although Krishna is never conquered, he becomes conquered by the person who will simply concentrate on hearing about him. So this, is, this was accepted by Lord Chaitanya, he said, yes. He said, now go on from this point. So Lord Chaitanya gave a lot of importance to hearing about Krishna. Let people hear. And that when they hear nicely, then they will chant. The Lord also says that Mahatmas, or great souls, always engage in the process of chanting the glories of the Lord. This is Bhagavad Gita verse, right? Mahatmanas tumam parta, or satatam kirtayan tumam yatantas chadra Great souls are always chanting my glories, right? Just by hearing, others derive the same benefit. Haridas Thakur was asked, why do you have to chant so loud? So Haridas Thakur replied, he said, well, if I chant just for myself, I benefit. But when I chant loud, everyone who hears, they also benefit. He said, who's better, one who just maintains himself or one who can maintain others as well? So by chanting loudly, other people also benefit. So they also hear, that's the idea. We want people to hear. So another significant point of this verse is that the mind of the conditioned soul, on account of its association with the material energy from time immemorial, contain, contains heaps of dirt in the form of desires to lord it over material nature. This dirt is like a mountain, but a mountain can be shattered when hit by a thunderbolt. Meditation, meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord 
acts like a thunderbolt on the mountain of dirt in the mind of the yogi. A nice example. I think thunderbolt is also mentioned as being one of the items somewhere. But I don't see it there on the feet on, in this diagram, but usually we hear thunderbolt is also there on the lotus feet of Krishna, and the thunderbolt is there to smash the mountain of material desires which we have, right? The, the form of desires to lord over the material nature. So these material desires, these are the anarthas, the unwanted things which are in the heart, and they can be destroyed by meditating on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Meditating on the lotus feet means remembering the lotus feet of Krishna, remembering some of the different features of the Lord's feet and some of the different pastimes which are connected with the Lord's lotus feet. This is how we can concentrate our mind. If you just simply sit and think, lotus feet, 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 and you don't know anything about the feet, you just know, well, five toes, oh, they look very nice, oh, okay. <laughs> no, but if you actually know some of these different facts about the Lord's lotus feet and the different metaphors which are used and the symbols which are there marking the sole of his feet, then the meditation becomes much more meaningful. Hmm? This is the point. So, you're going to meditate on the lotus feet, that's good. You have to know about the Lord's lotus feet. You have to know something about them. Then you can meditate. So, hearing is very important. You have to hear carefully and then chant. Then remembrance comes about. So, some people, we heard, some people are very advanced. They can meditate on the Lord in the heart. And for those who are not so advanced, we have temple worship, deity worship, engaging in the deity worship. Prabhupada explains here, text number 26, the Lord's transcendental form can either be meditated upon in the mind or placed in a temple in the form of a statue and decorated in such a way that everyone can contemplate it. Temple worship, therefore, is meant for persons who are not so advanced that they can meditate upon the form of the Lord. There is no difference between constantly visiting the temple and directly seeing the transcendental form of the Lord. They are of equal value. So going to see the Lord in the temple is not different from somebody who says they can see the Lord in their heart. But we, we're cautious about who is this person who said they can constantly see the Lord in their heart. They have to be very special, very advanced devotees. We get some people, in there, they, they just cheaters, they say, oh, I'm always thinking of the Lord, I'm always thinking of the Lord. They don't know anything about the Lord, but they say, I'm always thinking of Him, I'm always with Him. So going to the temple is important because we can directly see the Lord with our eyes. And it's just as the same as one who sees the Lord in the heart. And Prabhupada himself put a lot of importance going to the temple and seeing the deities. And he established the deity worship for all of us to take part in. And take part in the deity worship and as we go on gradually we will come to the point we will constantly see the form of the Lord. We do like to go to the temple, see how the deities are beautifully dressed, beautiful clothes, beautiful outfits, nice garlands, and then how they're being worshipped by everyone, how everyone's coming and bowing down to them, the deity. It's very wonderful. 
So going to temple, very important for us. We shouldn't think we're so advanced, we don't need to go to temple. Prabhupada writes, yogis take advantage of the process of smaranam. Right? They, they have, they, they're meditating, they're remembering the Lord. This is smaranam. Bhakti yogis take special advantage of the process of hearing and chanting. We go to the temple also to hear and chant. We can do hearing and chanting everywhere. So, smaranam, it's not very easy to sit and remember Krishna. But we can be hearing and chanting, that can go on all the time. Prabhupada is talking now about the particular benefit of seeing the form of the Lord, how it will help us when we meet with different agonies or anxieties. Material life is always trouble, there's always problems and anxiety and agony coming at every moment. So how to deal with these things when it comes, when problems come? So as explained here, we'll just read, as long as one is in conditional life, in the material body, it is natural that he will suffer from anxieties and agonies. One cannot avoid the influence of material energy, even when one is on the transcendental plane. Sometimes disturbances come, but the agonies and anxieties of the devotees are at once mitigated when they think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His beautiful form or the smiling face of the Lord. So this is the wonders of seeing the form of the Lord or seeing His smiling face that helps us to remove all the suffering which is there in the material world. And certainly suffering is there for everyone. So we do want to practice remembering the Lord and developing affection, developing attachment for seeing the Lord and remembering Him. The Lord bestows innumerable favours upon His devotee and the greatest manifestation of His grace is His smiling face which is full of compassion for His pure devotees. So, we hope we will always see the Lord smiling. If we are always thinking to please the Lord and to act for His pleasure, then we will be fortunate, we will be able to see Him smiling. But if we act contrary to His instructions, He will not be pleased. The entire universe is full of miseries and therefore the inhabitants of this material universe are always shedding tears out of intense grief. There is a great ocean of water made from such tears, but for one who surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ocean of tears is at once dried up. One need only see the charming smile of the Supreme Lord. In other words, the bereavement of material existence immediately subsides when one sees the charming smile of the Lord. So we hope you, you can always see the charming smile of Radha Madhava. You will see their charming smile and she, you will see the wonderful smile of the Panchatattva, you see them all smiling, that will help us to overcome all the miseries of our life in this material world. And Prabhupada said, this is, it's natural there's going to be misery, there's going to be agony. It's the nature of this material world. You cannot avoid it, but 
we can transcend it by taking shelter of the form of the deity, seeing the form of the Lord. It's one sure way to overcome it. So the final section of the chapter, going on to describe about the results of meditation on the Lord. You can go through the different verses. We've just summarized each of the verses. Very, we've just given a, a one, one sentence to describe the results of meditating on the Lord. This came from the previous chapter. Yesterday we heard Devahuti questioning about how, can the soul ever get freed from its attachment to matter? Because we always hear the body and soul, the body and soul, the body and soul. Can the soul really be separated from the body? Can, is it possible to be free? So this is Lord Krishna's, or Lord Kapila's answer to Devahuri's question. And he just, 34, the yogis experience, one develops love of God. You develop love for God. That's the goal of life. For the yogi, it's not very easy to develop love of God. Why, why not? Because the yogi is going to have many... We heard some yogis, they want mystic powers. So they will stay in the material world. Some yogis, they want to go to the Brahman. They want to become one. They think there's no difference between the Paramatma and the Jivatma. They can't distinguish between the two. They may get Sayuja Mukti, they go to the Brahma Jyoti. They don't get love of God. But the one, if the yogi is actually realized, he can see the difference between the Supreme Lord and the Jivatma, then they can go, if they know the relationship, then they can go on to de develop love for God. So that is the real goal of yoga, those successful yogis. Text 35, material mind destroyed. Well, we heard in chapter 20, going back to chapter 25, which was all about bhakti yoga, we heard that the effect of bhakti yoga, that it destroys the subtle body. Do you remember? Everyone remember chapter 25? How bhakti yoga destroys the subtle body? What was the example given? Anybody remember? Prabhupada gives, or Lord Kapila gave an example. He said, Bhakti Yoga destroys the subtle body. Just like? Hare Krishna Master Fire. Just like the fire, what? Fire in the stomach of the digestion. Yes, right, good. Yes, that's right. The fire of digestion digests all that we eat. In the same way, bhakti yoga, the fire of bhakti yoga digests, destroys the subtle body. So the material mind that's all burned up, the fire of devotion. 36. The soul devoid of material coverings. Material coverings. We, the soul itself becomes transcendental. We be, material coverings are all destroyed. The gross body, subtle body, the soul can be liberated. 37. Because he achieves his real identity, he acts totally unaware of his body. His real identity is spiritual. He understands he's a soul, a spirit soul, eternally connected to the Supreme Lord. So he's totally unaware of his body. We see some of these great souls, Avadutas, like Lord Nityananda, Avaduta. We celebrated yesterday the appearance of Lord Nityananda. He was Avadut. He didn't identify with his body. Sometimes he's a cowherd boy and he would be going naked. And Lord Chaitanya would have to come and tell him, put on some clothes and cover your body. Sukadeva Goswami was going naked. He was also Avaduta, totally detached from his body. Rishavdev, he was also totally aloof from the material body. 
And so this, this is a very, very advanced stage of uh, yoga, yoga that totally aloof from the body. The body of such a liberated yogi is taken charge by the Lord. Krishna takes care of the devotees. The yogi doesn't have to worry about the body. If he's really a liberated soul, Krishna will take care. You don't have to worry. He understands he's different from his body. 4041, Bhagavan is different from the jiva. Yes. If the yogi has not understood that, then he will go to the Brahma Jyoti. So we have to make a clear distinction between the Supreme Lord and the living entities. 42 sees the super soul in all beings and all beings in the super soul. The super soul in all beings, yeah, the Lord is in the heart of all living beings. Uh, all beings in the super soul, all, we are all under the control of the Supreme Lord. We are all under Krishna's control. In that sense, we are in the super soul. All beings in the super soul. Krishna, everything is in Him. Everything came from Him. And we'll go back to Him. At the time of destruction, the time of annihilation of the universe, everything enters into Him again. So in that sense, we are all in, in, in the super soul. 43. The pure soul manifests in different bodies. It's the same soul, the soul is pure, but we take different bodies according to karma. Karmana daiva netrena, like the Srimad Bhagavatam says, karma daiva netrena, according to our karma and, our, and the desire of the Lord, we're put into different bodies. 8,400,000 8, 8, different species of bodies. But the soul is pure. And after conquering insurmountable maya, he is self-realized. So conquering maya, that is required. We have to, how do we conquer maya for a devotee? We simply surrender to Krishna. By surrendering to Krishna, we can conquer over maya. I was saying also, I quoted the verse from the 10th canto, Lord Chaitanya liked so much, he said, spoke about, just simply stay wherever you are, whatever position you're in, and hear about Krishna. And this, in this way, you will conquer Krishna, who is unconquerable. So, we can conquer Maya by hearing about Krishna. And in this way, we can become self-realized. Text 35, Prabhupada explains the meaning of nirvana. Nirvana. Hmm? Nirvana. The, the Buddhists often talk about this. They're thinking, no desire, desireless. Prabhupada explains, Arjuna dovetailed his mind with Krishna's desire. This is called oneness. This oneness, however, did not cause Arjuna and Krishna to lose their individualities. The Mayavadi philosophers cannot understand this. They think that oneness necessitates loss of individuality. Actually, however, we find in Bhagavad Gita that individuality is not lost. When the mind is completely purified in love of Godhead, the mind becomes the mind of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is oneness, the oneness in desire, that our desire is the same as Krishna's desire. So the mind becomes the mind of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but we maintain our individuality, but we are in harmony with the Lord. That is real oneness, oneness in desire. 
Prabhupada gives the example also about the father with the family and the children, the sons. And they all have the same desire as the father. They're all concerned for the well-being of the family. But they're all individuals. The son and the father are individuals. But their interest is one. Their desire is one for the welfare of the family. So here also, Prabhupada Singh Arjuna dovetailed his desire with Krishna's desire. This is oneness, oneness in desire. Not that you have to lose your individuality. We are always individuals. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Right, the fourteenth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The living entities are my eternal fragmental parts. Sanatana, eternal fragmental parts. We remain part. We don't become one. We keep our individuality. And then how the yogi views his body, because he's become very advanced, so how he's become detached from his body, so how does he view it? We'll just read to you here. Because he has achieved his real identity, the perfectly realized soul has no conception of how the material body is moving or acting. Just as an intoxicated person cannot understand whether or not he has clothing on his body. That's a very fair. Some people become intoxicated, they don't know what they're doing, they do so many stupid things. The body of such a liberated yogi, along with the senses, is taken charge of by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and it functions until its destined activities are finished. The liberated devotee, being awake to his constitutional position, thus situated in samadhi, the highest perfectional stage of yoga, does not accept the byproducts of the material body as his own. So he, thus he considers his bodily activities to be like the activities of a body in a dream. The, the intoxicated person, he is simply acting stupid and he has no control over what he's doing. But the liberated yogi, he is also detached from the body and he cannot understand what he's doing, but he is taken charge of by the Supreme Lord. He's under the control of the Lord. So it's not that he acts, his acting, his acting is not on the same level as the intoxicated person. The liberated devotee is, he knows his actual situation and he's in samadhi, so he's aloof from the body. He thinks of it to be just like a dream. This is bodily activity, just a dream. Overcoming, the final verse here, overcoming the external energy. The external energy of the Supreme Lord is durvibhavya, very difficult to understand and very difficult to conquer. Bhagavad Gita says the same thing. Daivihi esha gunamayi mama maya durabhyaya. This material nature is very difficult to overcome. So here also Prabhupada is saying, the external energy, very difficult to understand, very difficult to conquer. One must, however, conquer this insurmountable spell of maya, and this is possible by the grace of the Lord. For those who engage in devotional service, there is no spell of maya, and their situation is all perfect. The duty of the living entity as part and parcel of the whole, is to render devotional service to the whole. That is the ultimate perfection of life. So this is the goal. Just simply do devotional service. That is perfection. Engage in service for Krishna, and you've achieved the highest perfection. 
a practical process. We don't have to worry about so many meditation and contemplation, the Astanga Yoga process. Just do Bhakti Yoga. All the elements of Bhakti Yoga are there. Any question? Anybody has any question? Hare Krishna. Yes? Meditating to lotus feet, the various symbols, what it represents. Can we do that during chanting? Is it recommended? Yes, you should think of the Lord when you're chanting when we're chanting the holy name. But remember, when we're chanting, we have to hear. We have to hear the mantra. We're chanting the holy name, so we have to hear the Lord's holy name. We have to also concentrate on hearing the holy name. At the same time, you can also remember the Lord's lotus feet. I have a question related to uh, the liberated yogi's body is taken in charge by the Lord and what is for the conditioned souls who are still not at the position of liberated yogis, uh, how to understand that? Well, Krishna says, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So according to how much we've surrendered, Krishna is taking care of us. The one who is fully surrendered, Krishna will take full care. So Krishna is taking partial care. And certainly, you know, we're, we're on the path, we're trying to surrender, we're not, maybe we're not fully under his care, but we're trying. So Krishna is helping us and he's making arrangements for our progress because Krishna is our well-wisher, he's our best friend. So he's arranging for us to come to him. And he's arranging for us to gradually give up all of our attachments and to surrender fully to him so that he can take full care of us. So we, we have to see everything which happens, it's his arrangement. And sometimes Krishna will arrange things, he will do things for us which will cause us to surrender more. Sometimes he will take away our material attachments. In this way he will force us to come to him more and to take more shelter of him. Hmm. Krishna says, when I am very merciful to someone, I take away their material attachments. And then in that helpless condition, then they surrender to me. So you have to understand everything which happens is arranged by Krishna. Krishna is not only just taking care of those liberated yogis who have surrendered to him, but he's taking care of everyone, everything. So he's arranging for us to come closer to him and to become more under his shelter. So how can I reciprocate that knowing that Krishna is taking care of me and in my heart I want to fully surrender and but I am not at that point but the desire is there strong in I, I, I Well I, Krishna will help you come to that point. Krishna, Krishna will help you come to that point. We may be delaying, we may be holding back coming to that point. And Krishna may push us forward to come to that point. <laughs> right? Krishna is helping. He's arranging for us. He knows each and every one of us. He knows our heart and he knows what we're doing. What we're t he sees what, we're, what is our obstacles. He's helping us. He knows also what we're capable of doing. So, you say you're not yet ready to come to that point. So Krishna also knows 
if you're ready or not. And Krishna may say, well, she's just saying that. Actually, she's ready. <laughs> you know, you don't know. We don't know. <laughs> but you have to see Krishna is the controller. And our job, our duty is to surrender to him. Now, so surrendering to him doesn't mean that we have to give up everything, but it means you have to dovetail it in Krishna consciousness. You have to use everything in Krishna's service. You don't have to change your life, but you have to change the consciousness. We have to be conscious of Krishna. So Krishna will help you. He is helping you every moment. He's brought you here. Krishna has also got a plan for you, for, for all of us. Yes, so we have to surrender to Krishna's plan. All right, any other questions? Yes, Maharaj, thank you so much. Nobody else has a question? I have a question. Are we having class tomorrow? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. There's a class tomorrow? Yes, Maharaj. Is there a class on Sunday? No, Maharaj. No. Not on Sunday, but tomorrow we're having class. Okay. Yes, and then we continue with the next week also. On Monday? Yeah, on Monday. Okay. All right. So if there are no more questions, we'll stop here. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Go back to Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna.